What's going on, guys? Time for another Sunday conversation. It's Friday night. I've got a little wild turkey in honor of the wild turkey guitar for sale here. We'll be with Justin Johnson here shortly. Wanted to have a conversation with you today about Gibson Guitars, the company that everyone loves and the company that everyone loves to hate. I've had a couple of conversations with the folks over there and wanted to give you a little bit more facts than most people know about what's happening there. I've got a significantly different experience than most of the other YouTubers out there. I've been a marketing director at a number of Fortune 100 companies. The last company I was employed at was Sears Holdings, where I tried to help navigate the company avoiding bankruptcy at all costs. Spent seven years there in between the stint when I had actually moved down to Nashville. So I've had a pretty decent set of experiences going through bankruptcy, knowing what associates go through, know what the management team goes through. I was the third circle of folks at Sears Holdings. I was in charge of running the daily meeting with the CEO to try and avoid bankruptcy. We put a gazillion things in market and I was the guy delivering news back down to the team as we were trying things. So I've got a little bit different experience. So I've seen a bunch of videos where people are calling stuff out and it's flat wrong. And I've actually had conversations with JC. We've emailed, we've talked on the phone. And honestly, I think he's trying to get there, but he's got so much legacy shit that it's a near impossible job. I've got a whole list of stuff here to talk through. So stay with me. This will be an interesting conversation. I'm really... Curious to hear some of your feedback. I am not an expert in bankruptcy, but I have been through it before. I have worked at Owl and Hardwood Lumber. I've cut lumber. I've been guitar building for close to 20 years. I've bought thousands of board feet of lumber. I've milled thousands of board feet of lumber. I've built hundreds of guitars. And I've been in this business long enough to have a couple of conversations with some really high level people about what is happening in the state of the industry, and who's doing what. And so Gibson Guitars, we all know, we all love. Everyone knows the history. Harry brought it out of bankruptcy in the mid-'80s, had a pretty good run, did some really cool things such as the Gibson Custom Shop, and then decided to get into a lifestyle brand, and things completely fell apart as they overloaded themselves with debt, and the consumer electronics market completely failed. And lo and behold, you're sitting on a bunch of paper. So they file for bankruptcy. And what usually happens in bankruptcy, from my experience and from working with some other executives who have been through it, it becomes a complete nightmare. All everything that has been promised to you is out the door. Every associate is pretty much up to get laid off. And the company becomes paralyzed in fear. And it is a terrible place to be. It is really an awful uh, spot to be in. One of the reasons I moved down to Nashville was to eventually get a job at Gibson Guitars and maybe help them in marketing analytics or something along those lines. And that didn't work out and it was just not the right time. There was actually a job I applied for which was uh, project manager, the CEO. <laughs> After talking with Two insiders, I was like, oh, that sounds like a nightmare, and it was. So here's some more information on Gibson guitars. The one thing Gibson is really struggling with is it's not owned by its founder anymore. So if you look at Leo Fender, Grover Jackson, I've got a thousand guys laid down here. Duncan, Bob Taylor, Martin. It's a big company now. It's not a family-owned business. It's a corporation. It loses a little bit of that edge when you become a corporation. You don't have that ownership. Martin, still after all these years, has some family members working for them. And it's a completely different environment, corporate versus family-owned. So Gibson in the 20s, 30s, and 40s when they were producing some of those iconic instruments, completely different environment than it is today. And I think the nature of the business world today has changed so much that it's uh, they're struggling to adapt. So they don't have that sort of internet personality or owner personality that uh, some of these other companies have that just 
isn't there. Fender made the jump. They were successful. It's a little bit different of a company. Fender was, I would say, historically the step down from Gibson. Gibson was the top end of the arch top market, the electric arch top acoustics, whatever, from in the 50s and 60s. You look at those guitars, I've serviced a couple of those over the years. It It's the golden age of guitars. Those guitars are awesome. T-Bone Walker playing those ES5s. Those guitars are stunningly beautiful. Uh, so it's just a little bit different of a company. Next up then, going into bankruptcy, like I said earlier, there is no guarantees. You go into bankruptcy, your boss told you something, your boss's boss told you something, and then they're gone. There's no guarantees. The legacy systems that have been set up keep happening, which is what happened with the Firebird guitars, which is what happened to the ES guitars. You know, it breaks my heart to see that. But the reason why they didn't actually uh, save those instruments is they were trying to take the biggest loss that they can in bankruptcy. So they come out with a fresh P&L. So there were systems in place to actually get rid of sort of broken or second B-stock inventory. The guitar just is right about marking those as second or at least cutting off the headstock and getting those instruments into hands of uh, schools or charities, but that's not the system or processes that were set up. They're doing what they're told and you do what you're told because you want to keep your job. So if you go to Prime Clerk, you can go ahead and read through a lot of the bankruptcy documentation. And having done that at Sears, I went through and read some of the stuff on Gibson and you can see all their suppliers, who has liens, who kind of uh, what kind of debts are out there. And it painted a pretty ugly picture. I'm not gonna pull up any of the documents here for you guys. You can go out and read them yourselves if you really have an interest. You can see who their suppliers are. You can see how much outstanding debt that was out there. And it's really an unbelievable number if you take a look at it. Uh, like $400 million. Uh, it's crazy. So what happens, you file for bankruptcy, you can either go into liquidation or you can go into restructure. They went into restructure. It's not guaranteed that they would have came out of this. So if you go into full liquidation, company's over, someone buys the brand and restarts you know, a couple months, years from now, see that happening now at Toys R Us. It's a kind of dog eat dog world and you do what your boss tells you because you want to keep your job. So it's a pretty scary thing that happens going into bankruptcy. So as you move through bankruptcy, you begin to reformulate a plan. They had a chief restructuring officer. He sort of is in charge of lining up the creditors, getting them to vote on the plan as they come out of bankruptcy. And there are different sort of voting shares depending on how it's set up. And this is where I, I get a little bit lost because I am not a bankruptcy expert. But all the creditors line up, they come up with a business plan, people vote on it, the judge votes on it, and they sort of set up the new company and they move forward. What's interesting is seeing that Harry still has ownership in the company. It's very small, somewhere 2%, something along those lines, which kind of blew my mind. Uh, but he still has a ownership stake in this new Gibson company, aside from some of the other majority uh, partners that are out there. So it's interesting read going through the bankruptcy documents. So they formulate a plan, it's approved by the shareholders, you get a couple pennies on the dollar or whatever happens with the, the funding, you come out of bankruptcy, you've got a clean P&L, you hire some executives and you roll. They hired a new CFO, they hired Cesar and JC, and now you're off and running under a new management structure, new board of directors, and all that debt sits out there and everyone takes a loss, life moves on, we keep going. I was curious to see if they were actually gonna go full liquidation. I didn't think that was gonna happen. Someone would buy them. The management team that they had put in place has got some plans. They had a great NAM last year. I thought NAM this year was done pretty well as well when I was down there. They started doing some things that were different. They relaunched the foundation. They started giveaways. So they were doing string giveaways to the players on Broadway, which I thought was a great grassroots marketing campaign. 
They did an employee day at NAM the day I was there where they brought all the employees down. They did guitar giveaways. JC's trying. He's got a lot of legacy stuff that Harry set up that he's trying to get rid of, but he's trying. I'll give him credit there. I think he's apologized for the play authentic. The conversation that we had about that was uh, pretty good. It was a little guarded. Um, you know, I don't know how much he really wants to have a conversation with me. I actually got in contact with him via an email, and I wrote out a whole email. He asked that our conversation remain private, and I respect that. And I sort of laid out my thoughts and issues and problems and shared my experiences. We have some common friends uh, between Sears and when he was at uh, Levi's. And he did a good job at Levi's with a company that was struggling. The most interesting thing that he had said to me was this is a 10-year plan. He didn't take this job as a quick fix, that he's in this for the long term and that all this other stuff will sort of blow over. And I said, yeah, we'll see. <laughs> we'll see if it blows over. I think they had apologized. They got some boutique builders on board in terms of uh, doing uh, some collaborations, which is something he had brought up and I had suggested. And it was a, a really interesting sort of let's get past Play Authentic and then that Firebird video resurfaced. And there's probably other things that will resurface too. The one thing I, I do disagree with is the sort of press releases. I think those are significantly lacking in tone and empathy and people can see through that today. Uh, the Mark Agnesi hire and the Cesar hire, uh, I'm not so sold on them yet to be quite honest. I think uh, if you look at Taylor and Andy, they got a guy out there who loves what he's doing and it shows. Um, not everyone agrees with his sort of style and persona, but you're not going to agree with everyone. Um, but I think they've got a plan. The one thing that I, I really noticed coming out of bankruptcy and what I sort of heard and read was that everyone wanted the Les Paul standard to be a Les Paul standard. Uh, the problem was they didn't build the P&L to, to be a Les Paul standard as an actual Les Paul standard. The custom shop drives so much money with the vintage original spec that you couldn't do it. They lowered their prices and got more in line with the market, but those vintage spec guitars make so much money for them that essentially what they would have to do is kind of gut the custom shop and make it sort of just a one-off. And they weren't going to do that because of the number of instruments that are produced. If you look at the profit margins on a standard versus a custom shop, it's more than double. If you look at $2,600 for a standard and $6,500 for a custom shop, you just can't get that math to work at all. You'll never sell enough standards with the original specs to make up for the money that you're losing in the custom shop. Custom shop essentially works very similar to full line material. You are purchasing the same wood, the same lumber, you're sorting it. The spray systems are slightly different. Um, but you just can't get the same profit coming out of bankruptcy. You had to flip the P&L, and that was not something that they were going to do. They would have never gotten approval to do that. So you're just not going to see the Les Paul standard as you want to see the Les Paul standard. The financials just aren't going to be there. And I want it to be there too, but if you want the Les Paul standard that was released in the... 50s and 60s, you got to buy the VOS. Uh, it was way too much financial risk to flip the PL. So, some of the product lines and extensions that they put out there are going to make them more money. I've seen some of the guitars in terms of quality, and they are better. The stuff they were showing at NAM was very nice. Uh, it was scary being in the Gibson booth <laughs> thinking I was going to get cold cocked by someone. Um, but it's it'll be interesting to see what happens. Uh, so that covers a, a lot of what I wanted to talk about, um, you know, the custom shop, some other questions I had and some of the sort of questions you guys are asking is, you know, is JC the right guy? Is Mark really going to be the face of Gibson and, and probably not after the play authentic, you know, him doing the demos and sort of selling the new stuff seems like it's okay. What I really think Gibson needs to do is get someone on the floor 
and just start showing what's happening on the floor. Gibson put in new lighting that was covered in one of the QA things uh, that I read in another video. And I think, you know, the conversation I had uh, was like, as you do new things, talk about them. Get someone on the floor. Get someone with some energy to talk about it. You got to have passion in this business. Um, you you want to see that grit, that that ownership, that that feel. You know, when Jimmy Page is out there wailing away, you know, we want to see that in the guitars themselves. And it's hard to capture that as a legacy company. There will be other shit that comes out on them that's going to derail them. But I think they, they've made some changes. Things are happening. We're still going to see some garbage. Um, we'll see. We'll see. I think the last couple of things I wanted to talk about were sort of the, the legacy and the broken company culture and the moving of, moving the offices. When you get a, a dictator CEO like Kerry was, he got a lot of stupid policies in place and you just got a lot of garbage you got to clean up. So as they move new offices, get an open office environment, I hate open offices, but I think it'll help with some of the collaboration, the way people talk about things. I really dislike that they're moving away from the production floor. I think it's going to be hard for someone to get down there and show what's happening when you're literally 20, 30 minutes away, depending on Nashville traffic. It's so one thing I don't like. I, I want that Elon Musk guy sleeping on the for, floor showing me the newest awesome thing that they're going to be doing. I think the internet appreciates that now. I do that in my own videos. And so having them not do it is, is very, very aggravating. So some of the pluses that I've seen, just in a recap here, you know, the NAMM show that they did this year again in their hometown was good. The giveaways, they've cut the shit with uh, sort of tearing down Fender, you know, the I stepped in shit thing. Uh, they started the charity foundation again, the Gibson Foundation. You know, hopefully they'll figure out a way to get B stacks out into schools and charities. I think that's a really huge deal. They've got the partnerships down with the boutique builders, which is a really big deal. I'm not really sure how that's all structured, but from what I know of a couple guys that signed up that I know, it wasn't as formal as most of us think it would be. It's like, hey man, we need to make some changes, let's try it. So those are some of the good things that they've done. The missteps were definitely sort of the executives ripping on some other companies. I, I think that's just leaves a poor taste in everybody's mouth um you know going after small builders is just not the right way to go i was attacked at one point for building les paul customs as a kit i never understood why i was being targeted uh i got a cease and desist or whatever and i stopped working all that stuff so i was doing kits for a while and i just stopped doing that i, I still think that's something gibson should look into martin does it they've been around for a while Play Authentic obviously was a huge mistake missed up. The one thing that frustrates me the most about that is the number of people that would have had to sign off on that in a corporate world. Um, that was bad. The tone, the message. I think if they had just gone after people and not done the video, it would have been fine. But Mark delivering that message was not good. Uh, I think they'll get over it. I think the internet will get over it. They'll find some other outrage to go after and I'll be doing a video on social media and internet outrage on another Sunday conversation. I've had a bunch of experience in social media. I've been banned from platforms because I've tried to market my business improperly. And then I, I really don't think press releases are cutting it for them. I think they got to get someone in the shop, someone with some personality that can actually go out there and show the world. What's happening? I know it's hard to get in front of the camera and put yourself out there. It'll be an interesting thing to see who comes out and starts talking. Press releases are not the right way to go. They really need to just show what's happening, show us that that life. So that's a video for you guys this Sunday morning. Gonna enjoy the rest of my wild turkey here. So my sort of views and opinions about Gibson. I think they're making some headway. I think they'll get over these humps. It's a long time, 10 year plan. So we'll see the, the missteps that happened today probably will not be the missteps that happen tomorrow. So we'll see what happens with them. Thanks for watching guys. We'll see you in the next video.